hate putting a title on things. It, you know, I just, what, what, do you, what do you put, right? Um, but I was, I was thinking about the message this morning that the Lord gave me. And um, so I titled it Running Man. And I was going to do a dance, but I'm not going to do that for you. Um, I look like Carlton when I try to dance. It just isn't, isn't the best. Um, <laughs> some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, running man, running man. What do I mean by running man? Can anybody take a guess? Shot in the dark. Never stop. Running man. Well, here's what I'm talking about this morning. I'm going to dive in first and foremost into God's word, if that's okay with you. We're going to dive into the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is where I want to start this morning. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 says this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. So I was praying about this word that the Lord dropped in my heart this morning uh, on, on running the race and, and contending for the faith. And, you know, we, we've, if you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard a sermon on, you know, running the race and, you know, making it to the end and put your eye on the prize and, you know, all these things we could, we could talk about. And they're all well and good, and I'm not discounting any of them this morning at all. But as I begin to pray and the Lord dropped this word in my spirit about running the race, he began to bring to my mind some memories. And I was going to put some pictures on the screen, but I don't want to scar you all that bad. Um, when I was in Bible college, I found myself developing a love for running. And I, I grew up homeschooled, so in, where I live in Louisiana, you know, if you're homeschooled, you can't participate in extracurricular athletic activities uh, and so I never really, it, except for summer ball and things like that, I never really played sports or anything like that. So I went to Bible college, and I found myself falling in love with running. And about maybe six months into Bible college, I, I could run a two-mile in about 9.58. And for anybody that is running, that's not too shabby. And I, I just, I loved it. I loved it. And one of the guys in my dorm was a hardcore runner, okay? When I tell you this dude was a runner, he was a runner. Like, I mean, like Usain Bolt runner, all right? And so I started running with him, and he started working with me. Now, this, this guy that I, I knew in Bible college, he, um, if you've never done research, if, if you run certain times in certain types of open, what they call open events, you can get sponsorships for Olympics, okay, to be on an Olympic, the Olympic team. Um, if you run a marathon in under two hours and ten minutes as a man, you get sponsorships to go to the Olympic trials and contend to be on the, the U.S. team. So the year we were at Bible College, he ran the Dallas Marathon in two hours and 15 minutes, just shy of sponsorship. This guy was a runner. But can I tell you, I learned some stuff about running that really just kind of woke me up spiritually. Can I get an amen? Woke me up spiritually. See, when I began to, to, to run with him and, and try to understand running and get better at running, I began to understand some aspects of athletic training. One of those things, I pulled up an article, and, and I won't read the whole article for you. I just have some highlighted tidbits from the article. Uh, but this is an article, this is a medical journal submission on the aspects of physical training in high-level athletes. Okay, physical training in high-level athletes. One of the things it said that really stood out to me is this. It says, rest is an important aspect of the exercise routine, especially for high-level competitive athletes. Rest allows the body time to repair and strengthen between performance. Rest allows the body time to repair and strengthen between performance. I want to talk about rest in Christ first and foremost, but before I do that, I want to play a video. Ken, if you can play that for me. 
The number seven is a big deal in the Bible. Yeah, in biblical Hebrew, the word seven is connected to the idea of fullness or completeness. And that's something we all long for, but don't often experience. Instead, we find ourselves working endlessly, fighting back chaos with no real rest. Yes. Now keep all that in mind as we turn to Genesis 1 in the Bible. It begins with darkness and disorder, but then God speaks to bring about light and order so that life can flourish. And this happens over the course of six days. Each day is marked with the phrase, there was evening and there was morning. But on the seventh day, something special happens. God stops and rests. Right. Creation is brought to its completion on the seventh day. And that phrase, there was evening and there was morning, it doesn't appear on day seven. It's like a day with no end. On the seventh day, God's presence fills his creation. The land provides for all of God's creatures, including humans, who are appointed to rule the world with God forever. Kings and queens of the seventh day rest. I can get into that. But the humans are deceived by a dark power and they forfeit that rest. They're exiled into the wilderness where they have to work as slaves to the land. Until they die and return to the dust from which they came. But God wants to restore humanity back to that seventh day rest. So he chooses to give the family of Israel that experience of ultimate rest so they can share it with others. But how? They're in Egypt, slaves to an oppressive empire who's grinding them into the dust. So God confronts Egypt and he liberates the Israelites, taking them through the darkness and chaos on the way to the promised land. Now, while they're on their way, they find themselves in the wilderness. It's easy to get lost, life is a struggle, they're not in the land of rest yet. But while they're on the way, God invites them in the wilderness to start living as if they're in the promised land. But how do you practice the future rest in the wilderness? Well, God tells them that every seventh day they are to stop their work, or in Hebrew, to Shabbat, so that they can rest and enjoy God's good world. So take a whole day to live as if the ultimate rest has already come. Yeah, this is the Sabbath, celebrated every week on the seventh day. But there's more. The Sabbath is just one of seven festivals that Israel practiced every year, each one anticipating that seventh day rest. That is a lot of sevens. And there's even more. Every seven years, the Israelites were to liberate slaves, forgive debts, and let the land rest for a whole year. And then every seven times seven years was the ultimate seventh day rest called the year of Jubilee. If anyone had lost their land or gone into debt, all was forgiven, everything restored. Wow, so the Sabbath, these feasts, the year of Jubilee, it's all pointing towards the hope of future rest. Right. Now, when the Israelites went into the land, they forgot their God, and so they forfeited their chance for rest in the promised land. They're exiled and enslaved again by an oppressive nation, led back into a world of chaos and disorder. But Israel's prophets said that their exile would end one day and that the ultimate jubilee of freedom and rest would come, but generations go by and they're still waiting. It's at this dark point in the story that Jesus appears and he launches his public mission on a Sabbath day. Yeah, he read aloud from the scroll of Isaiah saying that it was time for all captives and slaves to be released because this was the year of the Lord's favor. What did he mean, this is the year of the Lord's favor? He was talking about the ultimate jubilee. Also, oh, Jesus is claiming that seventh day rest would come through him. Right, he said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath and he confronted disorder and darkness and all of its forms, liberating people from sickness, sin, even from death itself. Yet, Jesus was killed, so even his work was undone. Well, it seemed that way. But notice, Jesus timed his death to take place at the end of the week. His body rested in a tomb during the Sabbath and on the eighth day, he rose from the dead. Oh wait, the eighth day? You mean the first day of a new week? Exactly. Jesus' resurrection was like the first day of a new creation, where God's light and life broke into the darkness. So because of the resurrection, we have hope in God's promise of future rest. But we're not there yet. It's like we're still in the wilderness, where we experience struggle and pain. But as we journey towards that ultimate seventh day, Jesus invites us to experience a taste of real rest now by following him, or in his words, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So 
I, I, I use that video because I think they, they did a really good job at wrapping up rest and the understanding of what it means for us today. See, in, in Hebrew culture, in the Hebrew word, we, we use the word Sabbath, right? The word Sabbath, and most people think it means seventh day, but really the word Sabbath is derived from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to rest, a day of rest. And the reality is this, is that Christ has come, and not only has he come, but he has provided the ultimate eternal rest in himself as the eternal Shabbat. See, we don't have to, to wait for the seventh day to get rest because we experience rest in Christ every day through the eternal Shabbat who is Christ. See, if we want to run this race and if we want to finish this race, if we want to run it, as Paul says, with everything we have to the, to the prize, then the reality is we must understand we must first rest in Shabbat. Rest in Christ the finished work, the finished rest. I think it's amazing as I studied out that word rest and, and they even brought it forth in the video, as I studied it out, um, it's amazing to me that Jesus' first thing he does in his ministry is preach in the synagogue on the Sabbath and declares that it's the year of Jubilee. To me, that is astonishing because it's, it is a, an affirmation and a declaration of the fulfilled promises He's telling him, look, all these things God has promised will come are now here. See, we as a New Testament church get to rest in that. Amen. Um, I think it's amazing to me. Uh, there, there are 10 commandments. And if you've ever gone past, you know, your grandma's house in the front yard, they're probably in there. Um, <laughs> I find it amazing that we have 10 commandments and again, these are what we call uh, Levitical law. This is, this is Old Testament law that Christ has come to fulfill. And he actually even holds us to a higher standard. But that's another side note altogether. But what I find amazing is if I went through each of the commandments as they're laid out in, in the Old Testament, each one in this room would say, yep, yep, we should still do that. I believe that's right. We should have no other gods before him. We should have no graven images and worship no idols. Yep, yep, yep. Honor your parents. Yep, I think we should do that. Don't commit adultery. Yep, I think we should do that. Uh, 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 you know, don't steal, don't kill. Okay, I think we should do that. But the fourth commandment says to honor and keep the Sabbath day holy and set apart. And I find it amazing that out of the Ten Commandments that we all agree we should still continue to observe and honor, we neglect the fourth, which is the eternal rest. We don't honor the eternal Sabbath, who is Christ, and set him apart as holy. So this morning I want to start by telling you again... If we want to run this race, it has to start first in rest in Christ. We have to rest in Christ. See, Mark 2, 27, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says this to the Pharisees who are complaining that the disciples were picking grain in the field on a Sabbath and they're eating because they're hungry and they're walking through a field so they're picking the heads of wheat and eating it. And they begin to say, look at your disciples, they're not even honoring the Sabbath. And Jesus says to them this, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let me tell you this, the Sabbath is not something God gave us as a law that we would do and receive, but rather the Sabbath is benefit for us. Because if you do research on the human body, the human brain it needs rest as part of its process. If you try to stay awake consistently without sleeping, you will not last very long. If you try to exert all your energy 100% of the time every day, you will not last very long. God's promise of rest in Christ is a gift. It's something we get to do. See, up until the Hebrews and the Israelites, the rest of the world had a seven-day week where they worked every day. God gave the Hebrews the Sabbath as a declaration to people around the world that in him they could find rest. When people wanted to do business with the, the Israelites and they say, hey, you know, let's just use this in modern terms. They send them an email, say, hey, can we finish this contract up on, on Sunday? They write it back and say, hey, we don't work on Sunday. And they write it back and say, well, why not? Well, you know, you see, that's our day of rest. God told us to rest. God? Rest? 
See, the Sabbath is our declaration of eternal rest. Amen. I want to tell you there's a, a, a missionary named Hudson Taylor. And I love studying history and I love researching history. And there's a gentleman by the name of Hudson Taylor. He was born in 1832 and he lived into 1905. He was a missionary to China. And he translated the Bible into Chinese for the Chinese people. He struggled his whole life looking to find rest early in his ministry, especially as he was in China, struggling really hard to find rest through his work. And he had an aha moment. In a letter, he writes this. He says, when my agony of soul was at its highest, a sentence in a letter from my missionary colleague McCarthy was used to remove the scales from my eyes. And the Spirit of God revealed to me the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. McCarthy, who had been much exercised by the same sense of failure, saw the light before I did and wrote to me this sentence. But how to get faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. And as I read, I saw it all. If we believe not, he is still faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13, he said, I looked at Jesus and I saw. The truth is this, we can strive with everything inside of us and we will come up exhausted unless we find our eternal rest in Christ. If we try to run this race of faith in Christ as a believer, we will stumble and fall and struggle unless we find eternal rest in Christ. He is the renewing of our soul and of our energy. If we want to, they said in the video, they quoted Jesus from Matthew 11, says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and in me you will find rest. I will give you rest. See, that's number one to run in this race. Number two is you need to be unhindered. That's what Hebrews says, that we need to cast off everything that weighs us down, that, that, that holds us back, that chokes us up. We need to be unhindered. See, I started doing some research because I think it's important to, again, like I said, history is crucial to understanding God's word because when we study out the time frames in which things are written, then we can better understand by looking at the culture around it what he's really saying. And if we look at ancient Greek culture at the time that Paul is writing in Hebrews, we understand that in the ancient world, when competitors would run, in competitions, <laughs> some of them would run a little more natural than I care to describe. Um, <laughs> but others, when they would get ready to run, they would take their clothes and they would tie it up away from their legs and take off running. They would take their clothes and they'd bring it up and they'd tie it in a knot and they'd take off running. Otherwise, they'd stumble, trip, and fall and could not compete. See, they were taking those things that were going to trip them up and getting rid of those things. Some even to the point of stripping down all the way, which I won't show you that at all. Um, <laughs> but they stripped away everything that would hinder them. I want to read a passage of scripture to you found in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 44. In this passage, we have the story of Elijah, in the story where we read about Elijah, he's talking to uh, King Ahab, and he tells King Ahab, he says this in verse 44, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black and the, with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, the city of Jezreel, Jezreel. This is the part I want to focus on right here, verse 46. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garments, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Elijah understood the importance of getting rid of those things that would entangle him. He girded up his, his, his clothes. He tied them in a knot. And it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he ran on foot to Jezreel before King Ahab got there on horse and chariot. 
See, the king left before. He was on horse and chariot. He was in a Ferrari. And old Elijah was on his bicycle. And he got there first. Can I tell you why? Because he understood two things. He was unhindered. And he was under the anointing. If we want to run this race, we need to be unhindered and under his anointing. See, I'm preaching better than y'all, amen. And I got an amen over here. But let me tell you something. We need to be unhindered and under the anointing. Can I tell you that, how can I put this? There was a, a, a man who was a missionary on the isles uh, off the coast of Scotland many, many years ago. And he had gone to, to minister and declare the gospel to the people and try to, try to, you know, tell them about Christ. And he spent several years trying to plant a church with no success. Very, very minimal success. And he went to bed one night frustrated, crying out to God, what is going on? What is the problem? And when he fell asleep, the Lord gave him a dream. And in the dream, he was walking through the middle of town, and he saw a cluster of people. Everyone in town was gathered in a big circle in the middle of town. And he, he was walking, and he could, hear, he could hear a voice quoting Scripture. And he's thinking, man, isn't this awesome? Someone's declaring the good news, and people are listening. So he began to make his way through the crowd. And as he pushed through the crowd, he looked at people's faces, and they were unmoved. They didn't care. Just staring with no expression. And he was thinking, how, how are you, what, what are you not, this is God's word. And as he made his way to the middle of the crowd to see who was speaking, when he pushed past the last row, the man in the middle who was speaking was the devil. And he said, how, how, how can you be saying the words of, how can you be speaking scripture? You're the, you're the devil. Why are you quoting scripture? And the devil looked at him in his dream and said this phrase, no greater power do I have than to declare God's word without God's anointing. Let me tell you something. The word brings death and destruction apart from the anointing. The anointing breaks yokes and sets us free. And I'm telling you, if you want to run this race, as Paul said, with everything inside of you and make it to the end, you need to be unhindered under the anointing. And I'm not talking about some should have bought a Honda, but bought a Kia, let me do a little spin in church anointing. I'm talking about the power of God. I'm talking about the, 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 the everlasting, all-consuming God. His power is so tangible. It's so tangible if you receive it. If you live under it. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we read this. It says, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts chapter 2, we see a group of people waiting for the promise. Waiting for the promise. Their eternal Shabbat, their rest had gone to heaven. Jesus had physically left them and they were struggling with this reality. How am I going to live in eternal rest when the eternal rest isn't here anymore? I can't see him. I can't touch him no more. What am I going to do? And as they sat in the upper room and waited for the promise that Jesus himself said to them, I'm going to send my spirit that will dwell inside of you and empower you. See, Jesus is the eternal Shabbat, the eternal rest, our salvation. And he sends us the eternal rest to dwell inside of us that we might run this race unhindered with his anointing. 
You see, Jesus knew this so much that even in Matthew 3, we see this. Matthew 3, 13 says when Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized. Let me fast forward. John's like, I ain't going to baptize you. You're God. Jesus says, no, baptize me, man. I'm here. So he says, okay, I'm going to obey. So he baptizes him, and he comes up, and this is what happens right here. 16 says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Even Jesus' ministry began under the anointing of the Spirit. And we think we can do something of our own works when even Jesus didn't start until the Spirit came upon him? If you're here this morning and you don't know what it is to have that anointing, that spirit of God inside of you that says, uh-uh, devil, we're going to do this thing. Uh-uh, nah, you ain't going to stop me. I don't care what barrier you, you put in my way. I'm going to hurdle that because you know what? I don't stop for you. When the devil says, no, 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 you can't do that, I'm going to say, watch me. Devil can't stop you. Jesus even said, greater things that I did, even those you shall do greater. I don't see no greater right now. It's because we're not living and moving under his anointing. Can I tell you something? God is pouring out his spirit right now. Scripture says in the last days that God will pour out his spirit upon all men. And sons and daughters will prophesy and dream dreams and see things. Can I tell you something? (laughs) I've been having a lot of dreams lately. And I'm telling you, God is stirring the waters. And God is doing something that I'm telling you. If you want to run this race, if you want to run this race, it ain't no sprint. It's a marathon. I remember my youth pastor called me one time and he said, man, pray for me. I'm training for a run. I said, training for a run? How far are you running, man? He said, it's a 90 mile run. I said, boy, you crazy. You are crazy. He had to run for two and a half days. I think it was. I said, you crazy. You have lost your mind. But can I tell you something? Because he trained, and he trained with rest. If we train and rest in the anointing of God, we can run that marathon with all energy, without fainting. Can I tell you something? God is wanting to pour out his spirit in such a way. But, you know, the the difference between... The difference between the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and the day in Babylon when they were building a tower, do you want to know the difference? See, in Babylon, the men spoke one language and said, I, I am going to build this thing. I'm going to build a tower. My strength, my hands, my work to heaven. And God said, no, 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 no. You think you can do it on your own? They couldn't understand each other. They couldn't get a thing done. Me, not see my. I don't know what he's saying. I don't know. Stuti be skilled. I don't know what it what. Nobody could understand each other. See, man in his own power, God confused his language. Man, in God's anointing, in reliance, God brought his language together. When the men heard them speaking in the upper room, when they came out and they began to speak in other tongues, every man who heard said this, he is saying the goodness of God in my language. Are y'all listening to me this morning? When man tried in his own ability, God wiped the slate and said, nah, fam, you can't do it. When man finally said, God, I can't do it, I'm waiting on you, God said, here you go, go to it. When we rest in that anointing, when we rest in that anointing under his spirit, man, God makes mountains move. He makes giants fall. 
He's the chain breaker. God and God alone. God and God alone is my strength for this race. The last thing I want to tell you this morning is this. If we're going to run this race, we need to rest in Christ. We need to live under the anointing, unhindered by issues. And we need to nourish our spirit. You know, the biggest controversy with uh, 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 Lance and Armstrong with his cycling situation, that whole thing was because they were doing transfusions. Right? They were, they were pulling him into a big bus, and they were hooking him up mainline into an IV. He'd get off the bike. He'd run up in there. They'd transfuse his blood, and they'd send him right back out. Why is that an issue? Because what they were doing was taking his worn out, exhausted, depleted blood, red blood cells, and putting fully energized, fully oxygenated, fully ready to go back into him. And he was running out. Can I tell you something? God wants to transfuse you, mainline you with his Holy Spirit. That way you ain't never running out. But it's going to take you. It's going to take you letting him hook you up. You can't hook yourself up. It's going to take you letting him hook you up. See, hope is to our soul what energy is to our body. And just like our bodies need energy to keep going, our soul needs hope to keep going. Our soul needs hope. The way we feed our soul hope is through God's promises. See, we don't hope about the past. Hope is not a past tense thing. Hope is future tense. Hope is expectation. Anticipation. Hope is ahead, not behind. Are y'all listening to me? God's promises are a declaration of what's ahead, not behind. See, when we nourish our spirit with God's word and we understand what his word says about me and we understand our identity and who we are in Christ, man, the whole game changes. When I tell you the game changes, I mean the game changes. It goes from Mario to Tetris. It's totally different. It's not even the same game. I mean, straight up changes. It goes from monopoly to shoots and ladders. It's different. When we allow God's word to live inside of us and we understand our identity in Christ, man, that is the best nourishment we can ever have. See, the promises he gives us are future tense hope and expectation. Something to look forward to, not behind. I find myself at a loss, you know, when I talk to people who, you know, are coming out of addiction or what have you. And, 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 and I, I've been addicted to things in my life as well, so I'm, I'm, don't misunderstand me. I'm not dogging anybody. But when you, when you say for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, you know, my name is Colby and I'm a recovering alcoholic, you're always going to be an alcoholic if you keep saying that with your mouth. There is power and death in the tongue, man. There's life and death in the tongue. My name is not Colby, a former addicted person to pornography. Pornography was my struggle, but I am free in Christ. My name is not Colby. I'm an alcoholic, been free for 25, whatever. No, my name is Colby. Alcohol was what I did. It's not who I am. See, the sin is what I did, not who I am. I am a son of God. I am one with Christ. I am free and free indeed. I am filled with the Spirit. I am a victor, not a victim. I am strong and not weak. I am wise and not dumb. I am. I am There's a reason why when Moses went before the burning bush and God spoke to him and he said, who do I say has sent me? When God spoke out of the bush, he said, tell them I am 
has sent you. Because that reality of I am is everything. I am with you. I am in you. I am for you. I am your God. I am. See, when we study God's word, when we read this thing like it's going out of fashion, when we eat it like it's bread, I'm telling you, there's a, there's a, a, a life that grows inside of you. The only way I can describe it, and I ain't never been pregnant, so I don't know. It's like this pregnancy, man. When you eat God's word, when you, I've had a food baby, you know, but when you eat God's word, this life inside of you begins to happen. This life inside of you begins to stir up. Just like when a mother is laying in bed, just like when my wife, we were laying in bed when she was pregnant for Ari. And she said, oh, baby, 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 give me your hand. And I put my hand on her stomach and I could feel, I could feel the kick. Oh, wow. That's amazing. When I put my ear on her, on her belly and I can, I can hear the baby. God, that's amazing. Can I tell you something? God wants to stir up inside of you with his spirit. He wants to give life inside of you. Then when people touch you, they feel the kick. When people lean close to hear what's going on, they hear the, the baby. When they, when they see you walking around, boy, you got that baby poking out, man. Yeah, I got that spirit inside of me. God wants to birth inside of you a life beyond life. A love beyond love. And if we want to run this race, we need that. We need that. We need the Spirit of God. There is a time coming. I'm telling you, I don't say this lightly, there is a time coming for the body of Christ. If you are not ready and under His anointing, it's going to be difficult, not easy. But if you allow his spirit inside of you, what's ahead is going to be nothing but a thing. It ain't going to be hard. It's going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be difficult. It's going to be joyous. It's going to be exciting. This is the best time to be a believer. It's, a, it's the worst time to be lukewarm. But it's the best time to be a believer. Amen. This morning, can I encourage you one last time? Be careful what you eat. Be careful what you eat. Because just like there is healthy food in this world that gives us strength and nourishment and everything we need for our days today, there's toxic food too. There's food full of chemicals and full of this and that and everything else. Full of everything that will destroy your body and deplete it of what it actually needs. Did you know that water, most water you buy in the store, don't take my word, go Google it when you leave here. Most water you buy in the store does not help you or hydrate you. It actually dehydrates you. Did you know that? Because it has nothing in it. It is completely stripped of everything. So it strips you to try and restore itself. Can I tell you, there is a lot of water bottles with steeples that are stripping you. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful where you're trying to drink water from. Because I'm telling you, there's toxic water too. And I'm telling you right now, if you want the nourishing wellspring of life, it is right here in this book. It is right here in these words. And it's not just about this book. Jesus is the Logos. Not that. That is words he said. Yes, it is. Thank you, Jesus, for it. But Jesus is the living word. And if you will take him inside of you, telling you, you will have everything you need. I was, uh, I'm closing with this. I was praying about all of this, and as I got to this part about nourishment, um, 
recently I, I, I went to the doctor and had some blood work drawn. And I'm 34, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm getting to an age where I guess I might as well start checking things out on a regular. And um, <laughs> so I went, and I was like, hey, let's just do a blood panel, check my thyroid, check my, you know, all those testosterone. Just let me know what's going on, all right, so I can make sure I'm on top of things. So I get a call. She says, hey, your labs came back, and everything looks good, but you are deficient in vitamin D. Okay? What are the signs of a vitamin D deficiency? Fatigue. Exhaustion. <laughs> Lord spoke to me as I was reading and, and, and praying and studying, and he said this when it comes to nourishment. He said there are so many believers who are deficient in vitamin D. And the best source of vitamin D is to step into the light. Y'all didn't hear me. There are many believers who are deficient in vitamin D. And the best source for vitamin D is to step into the light. And I'm telling you this morning, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Great I Am, Jesus the Messiah, the light of lights, He is shining. And if you feel fatigued, and if you feel worn down, and if you feel worn out, step into the light, brother. Step into the light, man. Step into the light. I'm going to pray for you this morning. You guys can go ahead and stand up with me as we get ready to close out. Pray for you this morning. And I want you to hear me very clearly when I say this. Nothing I pray matters as much as what you believe. Nothing I pray right now matters as much as what you believe. So I'm going to ask you this morning as I pray to believe. I'm going to ask you this morning as I pray and declare, believe. Decree with your mouth. Speak it out. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, in this place, God, we are ready to run. God, we find ourselves in the stocks ready to burst out. We're ready, God. We're so ready to run. But God, we haven't even started to rest in you. We haven't even started to come under your anointing. We haven't even started to be unhindered. We haven't even started to nourish ourselves. And we think we can run. So God, this morning, I pray over every person in this place. God, at the sound of my voice, whether here, on the internet, I don't care where. If you can hear me across the street at Dollar General, I don't care where you are right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare that we will find our rest in him. That we will find our rest in Christ, in the finished work. The reality that it's nothing that I can do but everything that you have done. We receive your rest. God, this morning as we declare out, God, I speak over everybody in this room. Sound of my voice. I pray right now that they would be unhindered. God, that they would throw off, cast off everything, everything that would trip them, stumble them, cause them to fall and falter. God, they would gird up their loins. God, they would tie it up. God, that they would allow your Holy Spirit to come upon them. And God, that your anointing would flow through them. God, that your anointing would flow through them in such a way. God, in such a way that everyone who sees them knows whose team they're running for. That everyone who sees them will ask them, how do I run? How do I come under the anointing? God, I declare that everyone at the sound of my voice, God, would drink from the well that never runs dry. God, as you told the woman at the well, if you knew who you spoke to, you would ask me for water. God, I pray for everyone at the sound of my voice, they would begin to drink of your living water. They would begin to drink of your spirit. They would begin to drink of the words of life that you've spoken over us. That they would begin to drink their true identity. That they would be able to drink, God, the wine of your spirit. That they would find themselves overflowing, 
God, overflowing as if to be intoxicated with your life. We declare it right now over your people. God, if there's anyone in this room or the sound of my voice that has no idea what we're talking about, God, I speak right now to them. Wherever you're at in this room, if you don't know the person of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ, the finished work for you and for me, if everyone in this room would repeat after me, I want to pray this together, and I want everyone in this room to say it. Say, dear Jesus, I'm ready to run. I'm ready to run. God, I start in your rest. I stop trying, and I start receiving the finished work. Jesus, I repent of my sin. I trust in you. I receive your anointing, your spirit to run this race. I drink of your living water, the water from the well that never runs dry. Jesus Christ. In your name I pray. Amen. God, we thank you in this place. Give the Lord a shout of praise in this place this morning. God, we love you in this place. God, everyone here, we worship you. God, we give you everything that we are. And I ask this morning, as we leave here today, God, let your word stir up inside of us. God, allow us to become impregnated with your life with your living water. God, your word declares that out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. So we receive it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. We'll see y'all later.